AFIO now. My name is Jim Hughes. I'm the president of AFIO. And this is the first in a series of recorded interviews with um, members of the former members of the US intelligence community who have great stories to tell. And uh, our guest today is certainly one of those individuals. He is a retired uh, CIA uh, clandestine services officer, highly decorated, I might add, with a long career, served prim primarily in CIA's um, National Resources Division and uh, Near East Division. He was also um, Deputy Chief of our East Asia Division, uh, head of um, our uh, Defector Resettlement Program. But most important and pertinent today's um, conversation, uh, he helped to establish the Department of uh, Homeland Security. So please welcome Joe Augustine. Joe, it's great to have you. Yeah, great to be here, Jim. Thank you uh, uh, for the invitation. Um, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that I helped create the Department of Homeland Security. You know, I, I want to talk about that a little bit today um, because I want to talk about the evolution of Homeland Security and the concept of Homeland Security and an insider's look, mm -hmm. frankly, of, of what the role CIA played uh, during this uh, during this entire process. You remember back in, uh, uh, you know, immediately in the aftermath of 9-11, there was no Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security, as we know it today, wasn't really established until within that with the Homeland Security Act of November 25th, 2002. So from 2001, September until November uh, 2002, there was about a 14 or 15 month period there where CIA played an incredibly important role in helping to devise uh, what we call Homeland Security. And most of your viewers I know, uh, uh, like me, when we first heard the term Homeland Security, we really had no idea what that was. This was a foreign concept to us. So at that time, uh, President George W. Bush uh, uh, appointed uh, uh, Tom Ridge, uh, who former governor of, of Pennsylvania, who we all know, uh, who became the Homeland Security Advisor in the White House. So that was his job. Again, no Department of Homeland Security yet. In the intelligence community, Director George Tenet of the CIA was responsible for coordinating all of the efforts of, of the then 14 or 15 agencies in terms of how it related uh, to uh, Homeland Security and what this concept meant. We had no idea, frankly. And what you're gonna hear from me today is a story of, of how we made things up as we went along, frankly, uh, how we devised things and how we helped shape uh, what became um, a Homeland Security policy uh, for the United States. We made it up, we did things, frankly, uh, and we really didn't know how to do it because no one knew how to do it. So uh, uh, George Tenet appointed uh, Winston Wiley at the time, who was the former DDI, uh, as the Associate Deputy Director of Central Intelligence for Homeland Security. And I was appointed with the longest title in Langley, I might add, I was the Deputy <laughs> Associate Director of Central Intelligence for Homeland Security. The only one, the one and only ever. OK, because that all went away. Uh, that all went away uh, on uh, November 25th, uh, 2002, with the Homeland Security Act. So I left my my the job I was in at the time uh, and I dropped my cover. And as you know, and, and many of your viewers will know, you know, living cover for uh, 25 of my 28 years uh, so it was something I was used to and something that that that, you know, we all did. Uh, I dropped my cover. And within two weeks of dropping my cover, uh, Director Tenet asked me to go to New York to give a public speech. Uh, this was late 2000, uh, it was early 2002. And it was to 3,000 New Yorkers, uh, many of whom worked on Wall Street. Okay. And here I am, Joe Augustin, uh, undercover officer, uh, going out and, 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 and giving a speech to 3,000 people who were still reeling over the effects of 9-11. Uh, but, you know, it, it made sense at the time because now CIA was providing information about homeland, about our homeland. This is the first time this has happened in our history. For a for hundred years, the U.S. was kind of on a honeymoon. We weren't attacked on our domestic soil. 
Uh, it didn't, our intelligence that we provided was all to prevent things overseas before they happened in the U.S. But now, after 9-11, the CIA was collecting information from places like uh, Islamabad or Damascus or Kabul that could be directly relevant to the security of our cities, of Los Angeles, of Chicago, of Minneapolis, of New York City. And how is the CIA going to play in that? So, you know, when you really think about it, uh, it made sense that CIA was now involved in homeland security for the first time ever. Part of my job, as well as giving a couple of, uh, of speeches that terrified me, frankly, at first, was being the liaison between CIA and state and local law, uh, law, law enforcement officials around the country. So George Tennant asked me to travel around the country to meet with chiefs of police to tell them that CIA was now there. CIA was there to help. Uh, I can, and I can tell you, this was a shock to much many of our uh, law enforcement officials around the country. They had relationships with the FBI. State and locals always had relationships with the FBI. And fr quite frankly, always not the best relationship. Now here was CIA coming to provide intel to state and locals about the safety of their own country. So this changed things. 9-11, and we've said this a million times and it's, and it's hackneyed by now, but you know, 9-11 changed a lot of things. And when you really think about it, you know, we had 19 terrorists on that day, on 9-11, that changed us dramatically. In the decades previously, in my, you know, and growing up, you know, the Soviet Union was a threat. Russia was a threat. China was a threat. But none of those nuclear powered countries ever brought us to our knees. But 19 individuals, only 19 individuals brought the U.S. to its knees. And we had to respond. So we did. Back then in 9-11, um, so... So, so the director says, okay, we need to do things and we need to get the intelligence community activated. Again, this is the period before the stand-up of DHS. This is a little known his, uh, part of history in the CIA where we, where, where we focused on 9-11. On so after that, what happened? The intelligence community, uh, the U.S. government changed. There were three things that happened after 9-11 when I look back on it retrospective. 9-11 changed what we did structurally, bureaucratically. And we have spent billions of dollars, billions of dollars to the current day uh, because of 19 terrorists. We created, as you know, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we created uh, organizations like National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, we created the Ter uh, Transportation Security Administration. We created the Terrorism Screening Center. These were things that we needed to do uh, because of, 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 of what happened. So the difficult thing for Americans to understand is that, you know, this was hard for us. We had no, we had no precedent. We had no history to understand how we could be proactive uh, in terms of creating some kind of, of, of homeland security. And, you know, we became better, but it took a long time uh, to try to, uh, you know, for us to try to create some, some kind of policy that made sense. And George Tenet was on the hook to do so. The concept of homeland security, literally, we define the term, as I said, as we went along. To, great, to George Tenet's great credit. Uh, he had all the right questions to ask. The CIA Homeland Security Group had very little answers to George Tenet's very good questions. So, you know, so we, so we, we struggled, but we worked very closely with Tom Ridge, and I think we made, we made some progress. So George Tenet is, uh, you know, and, and what we did, and, and I think this is important to understand, we did things ret retrospectively and we, we reacted to things. We reacted to things. And let me jump ahead a little bit. What does that mean we reacted? Well, you know, in December of 2001, 
uh, we had uh, Richard Reed, who we're all familiar with as the shoe bomber, who was on an airplane from Paris on his way to Miami. He tried to light his shoes. It didn't work. The pilot made an emergency landing in Boston. So what did we do after that incident? We take off our shoes. Okay, we reacted to that. Now you can't go through an airport without taking off your shoes. Fast forward a little bit to 2006. Again, reaction. So in 2006, there was a liquid bomb plot, as it's called, in, in the UK. And MI5 did a great job in, 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 in thwarting, that, thwarting that attempt to use liquids uh, on airplanes to take down 13 international uh, flights, transatlantic flights, uh, uh, back in 2006. These terrorists, as many of you know, uh, took an unopened bottle, put a syringe in the bottom, extracted the liquid, and refilled it with explosives, which made it look like those bottles were never opened, and they could take them on the plane. Once we heard about that plot, and we understood that plot, we don't take liquids on board anymore. Okay, so it was, a lot of what we were doing was, like, as I said, reactive. Now, let me get a little more specific in terms of what CIA was doing and, and maybe give you a, a, a few anecdotes in terms of how we tried to do things and how we learned as we went along. George Tenet had a very famous, uh, uh, it became a very famous five o'clock meeting every evening. He would bring experts uh, from the counterterrorism center. He would bring experts from the analytical side of CIA. Uh, uh, every day at five o'clock to talk about the threats. And you got to remember, after 9-11, there were hundreds of threats, hundreds of threats. And how do you sort those out? So the five o'clock meeting concentrated on sorting some of these issues out. OK, and 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 then George would be the, the director would be prepared to brief the president the next morning. Well, Winston Wiley and I were invited to those meetings. I would go sometimes myself. Winston would go by himself. And I can tell you, nine out of ten times, every time uh, Ten had asked us a question, we said, I don't know. Okay? It was that kind of thing. And it's not because we weren't doing our homework. It's because we didn't know. And it's hard to prevent something that's never happened before. Okay? So a few anecdotes. Um, one, one day, I, I get notice from a, uh, uh, an FBI, and this is before the JTTFs were set up as well. Now there are over 100 or so JTTFs or Joint Terrorism Task Force around the country. We didn't have many of those back then. I got word that, uh, and this is in early 2002, I got word that a state police officer in a Midwestern state had stopped a car uh, that was driving erratically on an interstate. In the car, were six obviously Muslim men. In the car was literature about the World Trade Center. In the car were gas masks. In the car was a stun gun. In the car was a Glock, uh, a, 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 a nine millimeter Glock with a magazine in the glove compartment. So it wasn't illegal. Well, the officer stopped, saw all of this, talk with the individuals for, and by the way, the most important part, the, and this is a true story, hard to believe. The license plate said Allah 19. <laughs> Allah 19 was the exact number of people. Uh, 19 was the number of people who, who attacked us at the World Trade Center on, on September 11th. So the officer doing the right thing, looked at, questioned the erratic driving, uh, and, and then let the, let the car go. Director said to me, how can that happen? Were these guys under, you know, where they looked at? Well, they didn't because there was no legal reason for the officer to keep, uh, uh, to question these, these people. Now that's no longer the case. Now there are access to databases, uh, uh, watch lists, and that kind of thing where they could have run a check. So we learned as we went along, and, we, and I think uh, we, we stopped that. Speaking of watch lists, there was a report at one of those five o'clock meetings that there was an Arab looking individual who had been sketching nuclear power plants in Washington, in Washington state that is. And he had flown from Seattle to Dallas. The problem was he was on a, he was on a no fly list. He got to Dallas, 
He tried to change planes. The new airlines, which I won't mention, wouldn't allow him on the plane because he was on a no-fly list. So what did he do? This individual left that terminal, went to a private terminal, a terminal because he was a licensed pilot. He rented, put his credit card down, his license, and took a plane to Washington, D.C. Okay? There were no checks and no balances at that time. Another watch list issue. We had heard, again, and, and when George Tennant asked me how he could do that, my standard answer was, I don't know. Another watch list issue. We had heard at a five, I reported at a five mm-hmm. o'clock meeting, or someone had reported at a five o'clock meeting, that there was a individual who was on a watch list who flew from the UK to the United States. Going around the room, George Tennant looks at me and said, how can this guy on a watch list and a no-fly list um, come from the UK to the United States? My answer? Well, George, there are 14 watch lists in the United States. You can be on one watch list and not another watch list. So we had to consolidate, and, it, and, and long story short, and this results eventually in the creation of the Terrorism Screening Center, which hopefully prevents that kind of thing. We learned quickly that, you know, and, and, and in the meantime, uh, we, uh, uh, the, the CIA's Homeland Security Office, would, would have occasional meetings, uh, maybe once or twice even a week, with other representatives of intelligence agencies who were also struggling with how to create and what to do in Homeland Security. We, we, we called the meetings. Uh, we were the focal points on the meetings. Uh, and, you know, basically we chaired the meetings. And I must tell you, uh, everyone was cooperating, trying to get together uh, to come up with what we could consider some kind of homeland security posture. And I can tell you, there were some excellent people in that intelligence community uh, 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 meeting. And I, the, the, I always say the, uh, uh, the award for I can't believe they're that good category goes to the United States Postal Service Intelligence Unit. I didn't even know they had an intelligence unit, but I'll tell you, and you remember anthrax, everybody remembers anthrax and what was going on with anthrax. Well, this intelligence unit in the Postal Service was professional, dedicated uh, to, to, to everyone's uh, great delight. Uh, they were as good as it got. Back to the five o'clock meeting. We had another, uh, we had heard through CTC and many of our analysts that uh, Al Qaeda was looking to infiltrate uh, nuclear nuclear facilities around the country. Um, George Tennant looked at me and said, "How many foreigners work in nuclear facilities around the country?" My standard answer: I don't know, George. Well, find out. Well, we found out, and we found out that were approximately three thousand nuclear uh, uh, three thousand foreign nationals working in U.S. nuclear facilities around the country. How many of them had clearances? How many were thoroughly vetted? The answer, surprisingly, was not many. So we learned, and the policy changed, and we got better. So that's how we, we that's how we that that's how we evolved and helped. And again, this is all with Tom Ridge. This was all involved with a lot of meetings at the White House Situation Room. Everybody was interested in what we were doing. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite stories. Um, Friday, and, 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 and many people who are watching this may have remembered this. It was a Friday morning uh, in early spring, I think, of 2003. I'm sitting my, in my office on the seventh floor, and somebody from the op center runs in and says, we have an airplane, a small airplane, going stall speed, about 60 knots, and heading right toward the agency. And as you recall, and what many people will recall, the agency was one of the top priority targets for Al Qaeda. I said, well, how did, and this airplane, by the way, I was told, it's going to fly over the agency in 10 minutes because there's no radio contact, but it's coming right at the agency. I said, how did we find that out? FAA radar? Someone said, no, customs radar. Again, I didn't know customs had radar. But anyway, they were coming over the U.S., uh, over the uh, CIA uh, at stall speed with no radio contact. Now, what do we do? It was too, it was, we didn't have time to evacuate. We didn't have time to uh, 
uh, to alert anybody that this was happening. And the airplane flew directly over CIA headquarters. If it had been a suicide attacker, I and many people wouldn't be here telling you this story. Okay, It flew over the agency. So before it flew over the agency, because we couldn't do anything, um, uh, uh, two F-15s from Andrews were scrambled, flew over the, uh, the National Mall looking for this airplane. Couldn't find it. The reason they couldn't find it, these airplanes, these jets fly too fast and too high. So the plane flew over CIA. After it flew over CIA and nothing happened, uh, two federal agents were dispatched to Manassas because they thought the airplane would land in Manassas. And they wanted to talk to the pilot to find out what happened and why he did that. Well, the airplane never landed in Manassas. So they thought, okay, it would land in Fredericksburg. So more, a couple of agents were, and I think it's Secret Service, but a couple of agents were then dispatched to Fredericksburg to talk to the pilot when it landed. Did it land in Fredericksburg? No, did not land in Fredericksburg. Where did it land? To this day, nobody knows. We couldn't find an airplane, okay? We had a meeting at the White House the following week uh, to find out where it was, and charts were there, and the FAA was there, and everybody said, this one escaped our, uh, you know, escaped our surveillance, escaped our entire uh, process. So we had to change the policy. You can't send F-15s uh, to, uh, to intercept uh, uh, planes, uh, and I mean, planes, Cessnas, uh, as 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 they as they stray from uh, uh, restricted airspace. So these are the kinds of things we did, and there were so many issues that came up along the way. So many White House meetings where people would say, "What are you doing? How are we doing it? How are we evolving this?" And again, we struggled, uh, but you know we had good intentions. People worked hard. The community worked together very well to create some kind of stable and some kind of logical homeland security policy. And there were so many issues that came up that seemed simple, but were not so simple. I remember going to a White House meeting to talk about anthrax and how we were going to deal with that and who was going to be inoculated first and how would we send uh, uh, anecdotes and vaccines and who would be in charge and how would we do that? Very difficult question. Then the question came up about uh, uh, having pilots armed in the cockpit, carrying a gun. Well, seems simple enough, but then you talk to airlines and many of them didn't want their pilots to carry guns. Many of the pilots didn't want to carry guns. They had to go through special training. And then if they had a pilot who carried a gun and flew internationally, let's say to Germany or whatever, do we then allow the Germans to carry guns into the United States? Nothing was easy. And we struggled with this all the time. I remember going, I was fortunate enough at uh, one time to go to a White House meeting in the Roosevelt was there and uh, Calm Ridge and uh, Rumsfeld and uh, Secretary of, of State Colin Powell. And we talked about after 9-11, whether we should restrict, whether we should restrict visas to Middle Eastern people trying to get to the United States. And it was very easy at the time to react and to say, yes, we should do this, or no, we shouldn't. But I remember very distinctly, Colin Powell said it, saying back and saying, wait, let's think about this. Let's be careful about this. We can't do that. These people provide much, many, uh, many good things for the U.S. Many of them are medical people. Many of them are graduate students, and we can't do certain things. So there was always a constant battle between trying to do the right thing and balancing that against the emotion and, and the tension that many of us felt and many of your people, uh, viewers felt certainly uh, after 9-11. All of this went at a, uh, a breakneck speed until November 25th, 2002 with the Homeland Security Act, which really uh, was a surprise to everyone uh, at that time. It was one of the best kept secrets in Washington, D.C., that Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security was going to be created and they were going to and, and that the government was going to put 22 different agencies together under one roof, 22 different cultures, and we were going to call it the Department of Homeland Security. At that particular time, uh, 
our agency history of Homeland Security uh, culminated with the with the um, with the creation of of, of of DHS. So it was a difficult time. It was a tense time. Uh, it was a uh, uh, it was a, a time of, of of paranoia, if you will. Uh, it was the time of uh, warning from, as you all recall, we're yellow, then we're going to orange, then we're going back to yellow. Uh, it was a time of duct tape. Uh, it was a time where people really uh, were looking for uh, uh, looking for direction and looking for the U.S. government to put together something that made sense to provide uh, to help our safety. And that's our small part, CIA's small part in the creation of a homeland security policy. You know, uh, you know, w we think it, it, it contributed greatly. We are safer now than we ever have before. At the same time, people say, do we need everything we've done? Uh, terrorism is no longer an issue. Well, I only point out this, that when you look at terrorism, and some people used to call it a, a war on terror, the only way you measure success against terrorism is when nothing happens. Think about that for a second, okay? We win, we are winning when nothing happens. So how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you help, uh, uh, you know, portray this to the, to American society that we need to do all of this? We have to do all of this when they don't see any results because nothing happens. We have to let them know we're winning. So our answer is vigilance, 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 and complacency becomes our biggest enemy. Anyway, that's how the, that's how the agency participated and helped uh, through the efforts of, of, of Tom Ridge and the, uh, the George W. Bush presidency in helping to create uh, the beginning of Homeland Security. Joe, that's a great story. And a piece of our history that I don't think um, too many people have um, heard in the past. Um, you know, uh, we don't have a live audience today, so I got a couple of questions I'd like to ask on their behalf. Sure. Uh, as you know, I grew up overseas and spent most of my adult life overseas. And so I knew very little about um, uh, domestic politics, uh, particularly domestic um, policing and security. Um, I actually read the 9 11 Commission report cover to cover, learned a great deal, and actually handed a lot of copies out to people who worked with me because I felt like others like me just didn't know very much about the uh, domestic situation. How much did you know about FEMA and local law enforcement and FBI before you began this journey? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, traditionally, uh, and, and uh, I... Like you did, I, I, I served as chief of station in a couple of domestic stations. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it was rare uh, for us to deal with state and local law enforcement. There was no need to really deal with state and local law enforcement. We had relationships domestically with the FBI because we coordinated our kind of operational activities in the United States with the FBI. But in terms of state and local, uh, that was really an anomaly and not something that we did uh, routinely. As I mentioned earlier, that changed with 9/11 because now we had to get them. Uh, now we had to get them intelligence from Kabul. We had to get them intelligence from Damascus that said your city's going to be attacked. And then we had issues. Now I'm jumping ahead again. Uh, we had issues because many of the chiefs of police would say, "Well, you know, um, can I get a clearance? Can I learn about who's saying this?" And our answer was no. You don't need to do that. Okay, we'll we'll tell you that this that your city is under threat, and we hope you believe us. But you know, I think now, uh, and 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 the era we're in now, uh, I think it's essential that we have certain key contacts with state and local that didn't we didn't need to do before, and we did very rarely. I you know you know one of the things that I did was you know and. Uh, it was worked very closely with the FBI, like I said, and and uh, uh, they were they were actually uh, you know domestically the relationships with the FBI and CIA are much better than people think, and uh, uh, I, I I'm I'm happy to say that my relationships with the people that I dealt with uh, in in the cities that I served uh, with the FBI 
uh, our relationships were uh, very good. You know, Joe, you've referred uh, several times to domestic uh, CIA stations and the National Resources Division. Um, I imagine a lot of our viewers, uh, if they are not former CIA, don't really know about that organization. You want to talk about that just for a minute? Yeah. Uh, National Resources Division uh, is a division. Uh, it used to be called, it had, it had many different names until we called it the National Resources Division. But these are CIA officers who are assigned uh, to work in, uh, in, in domestic stations around the country. And, and this, this division actually goes back uh, to 1947. I mean, we started doing this in 1947. The history of NR division was that we needed people out in the domestic field uh, to talk at the time with, uh, with people who had contact with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, 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 with foreigners, uh, we, we, the people who traveled overseas uh, and might be in a position to report back uh, what they learned. Uh, what, the, what NR officers do today is uh, two things. Uh, uh, they work very closely with the American private sector on a voluntary basis. You know, every every U.S. Uh, citizen we deal with uh, in the United States, we let them know we're CIA, um, and we tell them it's voluntary. But they provide incredibly good information, oftentimes, about what's going on overseas uh, through their business activities, uh, through their university connections, and people do it voluntarily to help in the preservation of our security. So there's a great deal of contact between NR officers and the domestic uh, business private sector. Uh, on the other hand, secondly, another role that N uh, NR plays today is to help recruit foreigners who are currently in the United States, uh, you know, uh, targets uh, from uh, key intelligence places that we need to get close to and we, we need to recruit. Uh, and that's where our relationship with the FBI becomes critical. People who are here uh, permanently or for extended periods of time uh, really are FBI uh, uh, contacts. Those who are here uh, uh, for a shorter period of time and there are targets, uh, CIA officers will do their best to help uh, get close to those people and recruit those people through um, uh, co great cooperation with the FBI with the understanding that these people here who make contact with CIA will then go back overseas where overseas stations can then, quote, handle these people uh, for uh, the acquisition of, of uh, foreign intelligence. I believe most of our audience is aware that CIA and the other um, U.S. intelligence agencies only have a foreign charter, that we have no um, charter for um, activities uh, domestically. Uh, with those few examples that you cited. And um, when we do do things uh, domestically, uh, it's almost always in cooperation with the FBI and in many cases with uh, the FBI taking the lead. And then, uh, as we all know, um, since the passage of um, uh, the uh, IRTPA, the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act in 2005-06, FBI was uh, named for the first time the domestic intelligence agency, something that we had not had in the past. Right. Joe, this has been a great conversation. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I hope I hope somebody gets something out of this and, and knows and learns a little and learned a little more about this kind of little known part of of, of homeland security and the role agents in the CIA played. Yeah. Well, you're a great storyteller. Uh, I know you have more stories to tell. Uh, well, and so I hope that you will come back again soon and um, tell us something else about your um, amazing past. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank okay. You. Thanks again. Thanks you to our audience. Please stay tuned because we hope to do this again in the near future.